that we've been in the book of Acts and we've looked at um, what the world was like after the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. What would life be? These people who had lived their life a certain way, now things would be different. They were Jews, and that meant everything that they did kind of surrounded that. But now they find themselves different. Now they are followers of Christ. What would God do in their life? They, did, they needed the Lord to lead them and to guide them. And it was a, a culture of change. Totally different. What would this be like? Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things. All things. How you do all things. How you view all things. How you believe all things. A total new culture. All things become new. And the word there means brand new. In Galatians chapter 5, if I can find my water, Galatians 5, verse 15, 6, verse 15, it says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything. Doesn't really matter your background, Jewish or Gentile. But he says, But a new creation. If you're not new, if you haven't been born again, then you're just living the old life. When Christ came, He came to change us. When Christ came and died for our sins, it was so that we could have a relationship with Him. And this new life is the best way I know how to describe it. It's the heaven life, even while we're still living on earth. Y'all have to swallow pollen down? Anybody had troubles with pollen this past week? Amen for good old-fashioned water, right? Just water. Well, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter who you were. It doesn't matter what culture you grew up in. It doesn't matter if you had successful parents or alcoholics for parents. It doesn't matter if you've educated yourself or you're still uneducated as the world talks about it. It doesn't matter if you're a high achiever or you really have no accomplishments to brag on. It doesn't matter if you're white or tan or brown or black. It doesn't matter if you're athletic or if you're disabled. It doesn't matter if you're handsome or plain. No one has all the advantages or the disadvantages, but we are responsible for who we are and for the decisions that we make, our choices, our outlook, our life. Jesus made a way. He has come that we may have life and that we may have it abundantly. But you're going to have to follow His way to have that. He's not an appendage to our life. He's not an add-on to our life. He is our life. He will affect anything and everything. You may have been born on a certain path, but God came to intercept you and put you on His path. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned. All of us have things in our life that we're not proud of. Jesus was the only one who got to choose his parents. We all have just, we just take whatever it is that, that life has brought us and we bring it and we lay it at his feet and let God do a miracle in our life. Today we're going to look at what is possibly, maybe arguably, I think the maybe the second most important person in all of history. His name was Saul of Tarsus. If you have God's Word, if you'll stand with me, we're going to begin, Kale, in chapter 8, verse 1. This is after Stephen had been stoned and left for dead. 
Matter of fact, it says in verse 2 that devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. But in verse 1, it says, Now Saul was consenting to his death. And at that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. Things changed here. Now, Stephen has been killed. Now, the persecution is going after all these new believers. And they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Look at what it says in verse 3. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church. Have you ever wondered what that meant? Probably every kind and any kind of trouble and trial he could do. He wanted to not bless. He wanted to curse. He wanted not to let people make their own decisions. He felt it was his right to make the decisions for them. He wasn't just going to let them live their life as they looked to God. He was going to say, unless you do it the way I say it should be done, you will be punished. You will die. He says he entered every house and dragged off men and women, committing them to prison. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Now, Father, this is our Sunday. This is our day that we gather together. And I pray that it's to let our hearts link with yours, to bring you praise. I pray that we've done that. To give you worship, we bow before you humbly. Lord, we come with our prayers. We come with our offering. We come with our thoughts. We are with our friends. But now we get the privilege to cast our eyes upon you on the throne, to look into your beauty, to hear the words that you sent to these people to give to us. And Lord, we pray that the Spirit of God would take these words and communicate them to our heart, that we would understand them in our mind, that our spirit would be stirred, that the Shekinah glory of God would be seen, and we can be changed. It doesn't matter how we were when we came to this building, but Lord, it does matter that today that we could be touched by the Almighty. Do what only you can do, and sir, we'll give you the praise and the glory and honor. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. This man Saul was born in a city called Tarsus. That was the leading city of the province of Cilicia. Today, in modern, it would be in the southwest corner of modern Turkey. Rome had been controlling the world for about 70 years before Paul was born. Paul's grandparents were landowners. So when Rome took over the world at that time, if you were a landowner, you became a Roman citizen. And you were actually given the right and the privilege to not only be a Roman citizen, but you could carry out your own culture without any worries. They would allow you, if you were a Jew, as they were, a Hebrew Jew, just to continue and to act like a Jew. As long as you paid your taxes, as long as you were a good citizen, you could be a citizen of Rome. Others would have to buy their citizenship. But because his grandparents owned land, that this was given to them freely. They were rich. He grew up in a rich home. His parents and grandparents were tent makers. It was a, a, a place there that uh, was kind of the, the separation between Asia Minor and between uh, the, the Judean area to the, to the south. Uh, Tarsus was actually up there in the corner. It had mountains on the north side and on the east side. It came down to the harbor, a very famous, really a, a man-made harbor in that day, uh, known all over the world. So this is the very harbor that Cleopatra came in about 40 years before Paul was born with her uh, uh, sales of perfume, <clears throat> and that's where she met Mark Anthony. It was a very famous town. And these tent makers, they would take leather and make tents, but they would also take the cloth that came from this large, long-haired black goat. And they were very famous. They were, all the caravans would want to buy a tent from there, or the nomads that just ran 
uh, roamed around, but also the armies. They were very known for this. So he grew up in a affluent home, but it was a Jewish home, a Hebrew home. Saul's father was a Pharisee, was an influential person in the synagogue of uh, Tarsus. Um, Saul grew up knowing Latin. He also spoke Greek and Aramaic, but because he studied in the synagogue school the sacred text in Hebrew, he also knew Hebrew as well. He knew four languages. Aramaic was actually a derivative of Hebrew, and it was spoken mostly, but just about everyone spoke Greek as well. In synagogue, he would study the, the sacred text, but he also studied the Old Testament and what you and I would know as the Septuagint or the Greek translation of the Hebrew. He uh, grew up with his parents in the first 13, 14 years of his life. He was there learning what it would be to be a tent maker. But at age 14, his family sent him to Jerusalem where he would study at the feet of a of a family friend by the name of Gamaliel. Gamaliel was actually one of the leading teachers in all of Jerusalem. He was very well known, and at this particular point in time, he was in his upper 80s or lower 90s, Gamaliel was. Very uh, much a, a reverenced and respected, and Paul was there with him there to study underneath him for eight years. When I keep saying Paul and Saul. Paul is the, is the uh, Roman Hebrew uh, Latin name. Saul was the Hebrew name. He began in a very uh, a Hebrew uh, family, so they called him Saul. Later on, when he became the apostle to the Gentiles, he would go by Paul, the, the, the Roman name. Eight years he studied in Jerusalem. He studied all the generations of the rabbis, all the oral traditions. You see the Sanhedrin that was there when they passed a rule or a law, it would govern all Jews in all the Roman providence. This was very important. So he would study those there. He would study the, 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 the Hebrew law. He would study the poetry of the Psalms and he would study the prophets. And he, uh, Grew up very well in that. As a matter of fact, you could really see the young Saul as part preacher, part lawyer. That's how he was taught and trained. It, it was a conversations of asking questions and getting answers back. You might find this interesting is that the term that they used of this question and an answering those questions back was called a diatribe. That's the term that they used to describe it. But at 22 years old, Saul was sent back to his hometown of Tarsus to be one of the leaders in the synagogue in Tarsus. But also, every young Jew was to have a trade. You were not supposed to make your living simply by uh, being one of the leaders in the synagogue, in the church, so to speak. So he went back and joined with his dad and began to be a tent maker again. But later on, Gamaliel in Jerusalem called for Saul to come back and to join him there. And he was given the permission to be part of the 71 people who were part of the Sanhedrin. Paul now is a zealot. He's a young man who just wanted to thrive in the, in the Jewish tradition. And now he is part of the Sanhedrin, and actually he becomes part of the ten-person ruling council in the Sanhedrin. And the time that Saul got back to Jerusalem was about a year after, listen now, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Saul wasn't there to hear Jesus' teaching. He wasn't there to follow around in Galilee and ask questions of Christ. He wasn't there when they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. He wasn't there during that time. But about a year later, he came in. And when he found 
Jerusalem, it was a different Jerusalem than what he knew from uh, age 14 to 22. Now everything is about this new sect of these followers of Christ that are called the way. Matter of fact, some of the scholars said that uh, uh, Paul, Saul, uh, thought so little of them because they, they, they said that the one that they were following called himself the Son of God. That didn't mesh very well with this zealot Saul. This one says that he is literally God himself. We need to stop this. We don't want him to prosper and all these people coming to, to become part of the way. He would call them Nazarenes. That was a term of derision that Saul would use. And his spiritual leader, Gamaliel, we learned in Acts 5, he said, leave these new people alone. If, if they're followers of this one named Jesus, if it's not of God, they'll just go away. But if it is of God and you're coming against them, you will be seen as fighting against God. But that's not really how Saul took it. When Stephen died, I mean, that was a big step. Everyone now understood that if you were going to stand up and claim Christos Akurios, Jesus is Lord, you could be killed. And it says to us in uh, chapter 8, verse 1, that they begin to scatter all over, the, except for the apostles, but all the other leaders would scatter all over the world. They would go up into Turkey and Syria and, and to the east of uh, uh Arabia to the south of Egypt. They would go to all these different places. So Saul came up with this idea. We need to stop this. We don't need to let this new set go in new directions. Look in chapter 9 in verse 1. Stay with me now. Acts 9 verse 1 and says, Then Saul, still breathing threats, and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Does that just kind of tell you his attitude right there? He sees this as his job. He sees that as his mission and his purpose in life. He was the Jew and said, we must follow the rules and the traditions of the Sanhedrin. This Jesus, he spoke against them. Called them whited sepulchers. We've got to stop this. So he went, it says, to the high priest and asked letters from them to the synagogues of Damascus, about a three days journey to the north of Jerusalem, a large city in the area of, uh, of Syria. And he said, let me go there and we will make sure that in Antioch and all the other cities that this is known that if you join with this group of the way, you may lose your household you may be jailed and punished. You may die. Let me have this privilege. He's pushing the envelope. He doesn't care. There's something burning of hatred for these people within him. So he says, let me do this. I don't care if they're found of the way, whether they're men or they're women, bring them and let me bound them and bring them to Jerusalem. So he begins the journey, verse 3. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone round about him. It's in the middle of the day. We don't know if it was a day like today where the clouds were out there and looking a little dingy. But listen, it wouldn't matter if it was a bright, sunny, blue sky day. Jesus wanted to have a conversation. This is the Jesus that sits on the throne in glory. Come on now, listen. Who is wrapped in the glory of the deity of the Godhead. He doesn't make it happen. The glory of God just is there abounding in him. You need to understand this and you need to know this. That if you are in Christ... You have Christ with you, the hope of glory, because he is the glory of God. If he is there with you, you don't have to feel alone. No enemy 
No weapon formed against you will prosper because you are in Christ. He is not to trying to win the victory. He has already won the victory. Through human eyes, you may look at it and you may see difficulty and hardship and pain and tribulation and, and, and strife and you may feel uh, harsh in your life and you may feel run down. You may feel hated. You may feel alone. But I'm here to tell you, if the most supreme is with you, you're in a good place. And as he was there traveling to do the business in the name of God, the one who holds the name met him there along the way. And the very bright Shekinah glory of God met him there, like it met Moses in the burning bush. Like it met Moses when he went into the, to the uh, tabernacle. And he was there in the tabernacle and it said the Spirit of God, the, the pillar of cloud by night, the pillar of a, a, a fire by night, pillar of cloud by day, sat upon that. And when Moses went in, his countenance was changed. When he went up on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments and God met him there and wrote those commandments on the stone, he came down, his, his hair was white because he had been in the very presence of God. And Saul finds himself in the presence of God. He's knocked down. The people are with him, see the light, but they don't see a person, and they hear a voice. Listen to the voice. Saul, Saul. By the way, he knows us all by name. He knows everything that we're thinking, everything that we're going through. You can't hide anything from him. You can sneak around your parents. Your children will sneak around from you. But God knows it all. Ricky came up. He was sitting up here on the front row. He said, how you doing? I said, I'm good. Then I leaned over at him and had my water and said, if I lie in church about that, I might as well lie about anything. Amen? We all, we're all just going through stuff, aren't we? That's just the things of life. But God knows us. Mickey, God knows everything about you and he loves you. Y'all hear me? Jose? Oh, I love it when I call somebody's name and I go. <laughs> he wasn't falling asleep. He wasn't. I'm just. God knows your frustrations and he knows your joys. And he's pulling for you. He comes to bless. Don't run from that. The greatest thing in all of life is to know Him and to be known by Him. But He says so much in so few words. Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? The word <clears throat> persecute means to pursue. Why are you pressing after me? Why are you so mad? Why are you not listening. See, I believe God had been talking to Saul for some time. Y'all listen. But he had been suppressing it. Isn't it funny how God who can speak through a whisper can get our attention? You know, every Sunday we'll finish the service with what we call an invitation. Because if the word has been spoken, we need to have an opportunity to react to the word. We need to, if God's word is there for us and it's God's word, God's best for us, and, and we come to it and he speaks in his Holy Spirit, we can do one of two things. We can heed it or we can ignore it. I've seen some beautiful things happen during the invitation. But I've also seen people ignore the Lord. And in the matter of seconds, they can walk out the door, they can get in a vehicle and they can leave and leave everything that the Holy Spirit said behind. Their thoughts can change. I don't know, something about the pavement out there. When, when the wheels start going down the asphalt of, of Jesse Jewel Highway, everything just leaves us. And we've got Cracker Barrel on our mind. 
or excuse me, Bradley's here, rabbit town on our mind. Why are you persecuting me? Do you know why? Are you just doing this because that's how you grew up? That's all what you've been taught? That's what you believe? Is this just who you are? There's a lot of people who have family teachings, I call it. How many people grew up in church? Now, this is a scary thing. And when they came of a certain age, it was an expectation that they walk down the aisle, receive Jesus, and get baptized. How many people have just joined the church like signing up for another organization, signing up for tea league being in a class at school, because it was expected of them. That's what we do. My parents said this is what we should do. All the things that we learn, but listen, nobody else can do it for you. And if you're just walking through the culture of life, the statistics are down, but they're still quite high. It was over 90% of people that you asked, they would say, yes, I'm a Christian. Now it's about 80% of people. If you ask them if you're a Christian, they'll say, yes, I'm a Christian. How many of you know 80% of the people that we come in contact with do not know Jesus Christ as a personal Savior and Lord? You can follow after things and you can say, I, I want to believe this, I want to join this, but it takes a personal decision to follow Christ. When Jesus was walking around, when he looked up to Matthew, you know what he said to him? Follow me. That meant he had to leave the other behind and follow him. Peter and Andrew, James and John, left their families behind. They left their business behind and went on a brand new adventure. Why are you persecuting me? I love the respect of Paul's reply. Who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus. I wonder how Paul felt when he heard that term. The one you're seeing, the one you're looking at, the one you hear, the one that they said was the Son of God. Hey, Saul, guess what? I am the Son of God. I am Jesus. And he says, whom you are persecuting, it's hard for you to kick against the goads, the pricks. Sometimes when the Holy Spirit comes and, listen to this word, begins to woo us, convict us, draw us, please don't throw me in the briar patch. Y'all remember that? Well, that was the, his escape. But for us, when they throws us in the briar patch, Every move we make, we get stuck. Y'all ever kicked against the pricks? It hurts, but you want to do it anyway? You're going to do your own way? You're going to follow your own path? And the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God will come against you and say, this is not right for you, but we do it anyway? Someone says, hey, try this. So they try it or they, or whatever they do. You take it and you steal but then the conviction of God comes within you. You lie, and you know it's wrong, but the conviction of God comes within you. You don't need to do that. How hard it is, how easy, but how hard. Can you get away from it? No, I can't get away from it. I've often wondered when Saul was there watching Stephen get stoned, if the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God was with him. Tradition would say that the leader of it would have been the one who threw the first stone. I don't know if Saul threw the first stone or not. Chapter 7, verse 58 says, says that everybody else that was there, they took off their cloaks and they laid it at Saul's feet. He was agreeing with the stoning. But I wonder if in the back of his mind he said, we shouldn't be doing this. Look at that man, Stephen. It's like looking at an angel. He's standing up and he sees God. I wonder if he came under conviction. We should never walk away from the conviction of God. So he says in verse 6, Saul says, I like this, he's trembling and astonished. 
Lord, what do you want me to do? Get up and go. Go into the town, and I'll tell you what you got to do. I, I don't want to talk too much about this today, but I, I just want you to know that there was a man there that wasn't willing, but he was willing to be obedient, named Ananias. And God spoke to Saul while he was in Damascus and said, uh, and gave him a vision and says, a man named Ananias is going to come to you and he's going to pray for you and you'll receive your sight. The Shekinah glory of God had blinded him. For three days, Saul did not, he did not eat, he did not drink, and he could not see. What do you think he did for those three days? Sit there in the darkness and wonder. The vision is there. He's coming to help you. And when that knocking on the door came, wonder who that is. It's Ananias. We'll talk more about this last week. But verse 17 of chapter 9 says, Ananias went his way, entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, I love this now, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight, and he arose and was baptized. What are you going to do with Jesus? What are you going to do? Will you believe? Saul did. Will you repent? Absolutely. By the way, repenting is not a one-time thing. It's a daily thing. Will you follow? Saul spent the rest of his life following Christ. It actually took him to Rome, where he was imprisoned twice, and beheaded for the cause of Christ. And that's something that Paul said to us, Galatians 2.20. I'm already crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but it's Christ who lives within me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Are you going to follow? Are you? Are you going to give your life to Him? New creation. A decision to give your life to Christ. It means there's change. In the next 30 seconds, please hear me very well. If you've made a decision for Christ, but then you went and you lived your old life, if you don't if you don't know change, you don't know Christ. Every year, we make these new resolutions. Sometimes every week, people will come to church and they say, I'll do better. I've said it myself a thousand times. But understand, if Jesus is Lord, He is Lord of all. Somebody's life can be changed in a moment. You can be saved. Your name can be written in the, in the book of life in heaven. You can have the Almighty with you. This is our message. This is our story. This is our life. I heard this past week of a church member who got saved. We were talking and I said, praise God. Praise God. Now, I just want you to know something. I don't want anybody to go to hell from the, from the church rolls of New Holland. That would have been a good time for an amen. And if you're wondering, you can make it right. You can get it right. When Paul... I keep calling Paul, calling him Saul. When Ananias laid 
hands on him. The Holy Spirit entered him. He could now see. He got up, and you know what he did? He got baptized. They used to make it a whole lot harder in church than it is now. They made you walk up the aisle. Folks, I got a word for you. You meet me anywhere, anytime, and I'll talk to you about Christ. It's not like of my whole week I got 30 seconds to talk to people about Christ. But you need to make a public decision to follow Christ. That's really what baptism is. Baptism is saying you are dying to the old life, you've given yourself away, now you're to raise to walk in newness of life. If you feel the leadership, the conviction of God in your life, you need to do something. Nobody should walk through life wondering. You can have peace, folks. The gospel is good. It will bless. There are too many people who know that they need to do something, but they'll always say this, I just don't know if I'm ready. I have one last verse I want to quote to you. This is Jesus' words, Matthew 10, verse 33. Whoever denies me before men, Jesus said this plainly, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Why would you be ashamed? Is it a big step? You better believe it. Is it a step that you'll always thank God for? Yes. It's something you'll never regret. Saul had it all. And he gave it all away. He saw, he looked at his old life and everything he accomplished. Philippians 3. He said, I look at all that as rubbish. His family disowned him. He had a sister he never saw again. The people in the Sanhedrin who looked up to him now called him enemy. But he said to know Christ is so much more. Don't count the cost. Just follow the cross and it'll lead you home. If I had any more words that I could use to help you, to urge you, to make sure that things are right, and if you know someone that doesn't know for sure that they're saved, that they're a new creation, you need to go to them, child, grandchild, lovingly, kindly, show them the good news, co-worker, teacher, Neighbor, friend, yes, in two short weeks, it'll be Resurrection Sunday. But any day is good to get saved. Luke 16 talks about the rich man and Lazarus the beggar. They both came to death. One was carried to be in Abraham's bosom, the other opened his eyes, that means he was conscious, in hell. Though he had everything the world could say was important, he was a rich man. He had nothing forevermore. Nothing except for regret. If you can hear my voice, you don't have to live with regret. I'm not going to embarrass you today. I'm not, I don't think that's of God. I think I would treat you the way I would want to be treated. Mark, we used to sing a song, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. I think you need to do that. I think you need to stand up and say, I am not embarrassed of you. I think we need to give our heart and life to Christ. But if I can talk to you personally, please understand, I will not embarrass you. I will not hurt you. 
I can, tell you, I can show you how Christ can change you to the uttermost. But it's your decision. Don't let what anybody else might think keep you from making the greatest decision that can be made.